All right, guys, welcome back for another video. Well, I know it's been a while since I uploaded a video, but uh, I've been actually taking part in a uh, challenge and a prop trading account uh, through the broker FTMO. If you guys haven't heard about FTMO, you know, go check them out. They're very legit. Uh, but I won't get too deep into that today. I just want to talk about the uh, overall market structure. Uh, and we're actually looking at SPY, uh, the S&P 500 index. And we just got the weekly close. It is Friday, and uh, the weekly candle just closed, closed above these highs, confirming higher highs on the weekly, right? Um, and higher lows, higher lows relative to this low. So all the bears who were, uh, you know, considered themselves to be trend traders, and they were bearish because, you know, there was a, a weekly downtrend. Um, you know, are they going to switch their buys now, or are they going to find some other information that, uh, you know? confirms their bearish bias. It, it kind of, you know, begs the question, are you really a trend trader, right? If, if you are really a trend trader, this would be your signal right here, not necessarily to enter a long position, right? Because uh, just because when you get a trend confirmation doesn't mean that, you know, it's necessarily a great entry. But um, it does, uh, by necessity, mean you need to shift your bias if you're a trend trader, because this is now an uptrend. If you're just going by the book, uh, which means you'll, you know, you'd be looking for uh, long entries. And if I were, I, I don't really trade spy, but if I were looking for a long entry, you know, um, I would be looking for, um, you know, actually not that deep of a retracement. Really, the the one level we got right here. This is the level that broke the prior uh, high, that the high that we're talking about, right? So it's a significant previous high. You got your impulsive move up there. So I'd be focusing really on this swing, right? Um, you know, even though it, it might not be a, uh, you know, a, a great entry right here, you may get it. The market may open on Monday and push a little bit lower down to these areas. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that the swing holds, but you know, if I were to trading spy, I would be looking for a push down into these levels right here to take a trade. But I don't think, you know, many people don't really, uh, watch this channel for spy. They watch for Bitcoin and, uh, also a little bit of Forex as well. Uh, so here you've got your parabolic chart on the DXY, right? Uh, dollar currency, excuse me, the dollar currency index started going parabolic back here in May, all the way up to October, broke the parabola at some point around Halloween, and it has since ran down here, just barely wicked into this area of inefficiency right here, this uh, major gap left by the uh, parabola. You could actually refer to this as the most inefficient leg of the entire parabola. So, um, you know, tested down here, uh, ran back above the prior weekly high. So I think, you know, now you've got a very uh, opportunistic trade on DXY. Now, I know a lot of people don't really trade Dixie or the dollar, um, but it's, it's a good index if you want to measure your bias, right? So we had the prior weekly high right here. And we have today's weekly low testing off the top of this level right here. Now you can set this up, you know, if if price were ever to come back down and take out this 108.100.82 level, it would probably come down to this area over here, 99.4, maybe a little bit lower, but into the bodies of these candles right here. So, you know, it's a very actionable, uh, you know, trade if it were a tradable instrument, but you know, really just for your bias, right? I mean, you know, now that we got to close above uh, the prior weekly high, which is actually over here, uh, you know, now I'm looking at this as, you know, DXY is bottomed out. It's probably going to continue higher. <clears throat> Excuse me, when the uh, parabola broke, the parabola broke down, you know, in a similar fashion to the way that, you know, it went up, right? It went up parabolically, went down parabolically. Very inefficient movement. You got a lot of volatility. Um, and, you know, if the dollar currency index uh, bottoms out here, probably runs up, uh, you know, the natural level I'd be looking for is this area right here, because that's area uh, another area of um, volatility as well. Now, again, this is just sort of very basic, uh, you know, how I determine my bias, right? After I saw what I saw on, on DXY, you know, I'm going to be a little bit, um, more bearish on some of the risk assets out there. Uh, not particularly Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin's a little bit different, um, but 
because I think some of the things that are going on in Bitcoin are extremely bullish, uh, despite even despite DXY. Because you got to remember, Bitcoin, you know, it it, it trades against um, every currency in the world. So, you know, if you're the DXY, you know, it it does provide some headwind for Bitcoin, but uh, not exactly, you know, the type of headwind that it would provide for U.S. equities, right? Because U.S. equities by nature, pretty much, you know, only trade against dollars. So let me pull up the uh, trading panel right here. Uh, you can see my uh, position live from Coinbase. I've got this position that, you know, I took from uh, much lower, basically before the break down in January of January 11th. It's only three weeks ago. It kind of feels like a long time ago that, you know, Bitcoin was down sort of close to the 16,000 territory, but it really was only three weeks ago. And I have this pretty large position, this 1,000 Bitcoin position from down there. And this uh, 112 hedge um, from 23.3, you know, basically the current price right now. Um, so, you know, do am I looking at this? You know, I, I would really anchor... Um, Hold on, let's just go through the account history right now. You can see this is legit. I've got all the active trades. PL, profit and loss. Doo -doo -doo. Some big wins right there. But you can see, you know, some of these uh, PLs are actually uh, from the hedge that I was trading against the underlying position uh, that I had to pull off, you know, as, you know, Bitcoin was going parabolic. And I, I uploaded some videos. Uh, kind of to that effect, but uh, you can see that here. This is just to show that this account, you know, it's it's legit. Um, there's a lot of equity. You got six million PNL equity is pretty damn high relative to the account balance, but that's because the position's open right here. If I were to close the position, um, you know, the equity would, you know, the account balance would reflect the equity. Now, if we go to the weekly, let's see. The reason I'm not closing this position is because I'm really in this position for the high time frame trade, which means that I want to see um, this high right here broken above and then continuation up into the, the bodies of these candles up here, this 36,000. That's really the level where I would start to uh, take profit, significant profit on this position rather than just hedge and you know manage the underlying hedge. Uh, up here, I would start, you know, to 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 scale out of this position. Um, I mean, there's there's really no uh, determination that you know where exactly price would stop, but this is the level you would naturally look to. So, I, you know, I don't really uh, apply all or nothing thinking when I'm approaching trading. I, you know, I just start pulling off significant risk here, um, and you know, continue as it goes higher. Uh, but always leaving a base position down here just because, you know, it's just such a favorable position that's right here. Um, I wouldn't want to let it go. Now let's see. Let's go to the daily chart. We got our daily candles right there. You know, uh, what I would mention is sort of along these lines that when I'm looking at this swing, I would want to mark it off like this. We've got this impulsive run up, these highs broken. You can see as price ran into these highs, it ran into this old historic level, which was actually the high from the before uh, Sam Bankman freed and the FTX collapse collapsed over here, went down to the lows. You can see price ran up to those highs. And when price ran up to those highs, let's go back to the four hour, it entered a different state of delivery. It entered a distributive phase right here. So you get a push above the high, move down, push above the high, move down, push above the high, move down, push above the high, and then move down back to the base. If you were watching one of my previous videos, you know that I had a support level marked off here. And I pulled off a significant portion of my hedge uh, when price ran down uh, to this level, actually at this exact support right here, the bodies of the candles essentially. So I didn't get the absolute low of this wick right here, uh, but I got the lion's share. Um, and, you know, that's that's all you really need to do. Um, and anyway, so I started building a little bit of the hedge back um, and then up here. 
And as price broke above the range, then, you know, I uh, started aggressively pulling off the hedge. And the reason why I was building the hedge was because, you know, at this point when, when price had gone up to this part, I didn't necessarily know that it was going to continue to run, right? It, could, it had entered this distributive phase. Um, you know, it could potentially, you know, just collapse and fill in this price swing right here uh, all the way down to the origin. You, you know, you definitely don't know. And that's that's kind of the purpose of a hedge, right? So it's kind of, you know, you're hedging yourself against the, you know, the possibilities that exist in the market. I mean, even if you have an edge, right, even if you are on the right side of the probabilities, you may only have, you know, a 60% chance of, of winning. Uh, so you still, it's still favorable to hedge yourself against those low probability scenarios because they do play out. I mean, if you have a, a 40% uh, scenario, that's going to play out a lot, you know, especially if you're taking a lot of iterations. Now, of course, your the size of your hedge relative to your underlying position will affect those underlying probabilities and you want to have the hedge much smaller. And what that means is, you know, different for everybody, but uh, it's something, you know, everybody's got to work out. But anyway, we got the broke, uh, the break above this level up here. And then price kind of does something similar to when it kind of stalled out right here, right? So Bitcoin moves up here, probably above some prior high. Let's see. Yeah, above this high right here. Runs, you know, people have stop losses up there. <clears throat> so it runs above that, draws liquidity. Remember, as price is consolidating here, liquidity is drawing away from the market and it ultimately breaks up, runs above the liquidity above that old historic high, and then, you know, cools off for a little bit, right? So uh, it enters a similar state of distribution um, as it did here. So you get this high right here. A run above that high, another run above the high, collapse back into the base, similar to how it did right here, collapsing back into the base, and then another run into the high. So I guess the question now is, you know, you know, in the next, um, you know, few uh, trading days, the question is, okay, does price collapse back into the base uh, again one more time, or does it break? you know, break the highs like it did here, right? And and that's, you know, um, I would argue that the probabilities for it breaking higher are a little bit more likely just because, um, you know, uh, we had the FOMC meeting. Um, let's see if I can mark this off on the chart. I'll go to the hourly chart. Uh, we had the FOM FOMC meeting, excuse me, on uh, Wednesday of this week. It's really a two-day meeting starting on Tuesday, and but a lot of the data hits the market on Wednesday. And we can mark that data off right here. I'll, I'll just mark it before the impulsive move. So you got February 1st, Wednesday, February 1st. The Fed uh, leaks their intention to the media. And we can also mark off these highs right here. So you get uh, the Fed starts talking. You get this impulsive move right here. We can even mark that. Well, you... You, you get the idea where, where this high is right there. So let's see. I'm trying to find, uh, let's see what we got. Bear with me here. All right, so price really starts to expand impulsively right here, right? This is where the FOMC data hits the market, right? And this is very common of the market to enter a state of, you know, withdrawing liquidity prior to an FOMC meeting uh, by the Federal Reserve. The market's basically, you know, liquidity is drawing away from the market as it awaits that data release, right? Um, you get the idea. And then you, then you get the data release and price moves uh, very impulsively above that old high we marked off with the black line. And again, it's old relative to the four-hour time frame, but uh, you get that move above there. Um, so this is really the swing I'm paying attention to right now. I think, you know, as long as the uh, lows from the uh, FOMC impulsive move, uh, you know, whether you want to mark off the body right here or the wick low right here, it depends on if you trade wicks or bodies, if you're trading bodies, you're probably going to want to, you know, look for a close uh, below that level. Uh, let's see. It, you know, it's a little bit different on the 15-minute or the hourly, but uh, basically the broad idea is that 
you know, if you see this area, you know, be um, lost on a convincing, you know, a significant close on decent volume below this level, that's when I start to think that the probabilities are actually shifting to, you know, price collapsing. But so long as price remains above uh, this uh, swing right here, I'm a little bit biased for price actually continuing. And you can see where it is right there. So um, FOMC, the market liked what the Fed said. Uh, they raised by 25 basis points. Um, but 25 basis points was, you know, already kind of baked in in the market. So um, that that's one of those things where, you know, if, if, it, if everybody's been talking about it and the Fed has been talking about it for months, um, it's probably already priced in. And when that uh, priced in data does hit the market, it really doesn't do anything, right? It's, it's really not either bullish or bearish. Um, I, I think the reason why, but what it does do is it does relieve some of the more uncertain elements of the market, right? Because leading into the FOMC, you know, there's there's always the possibility that the Fed could come out and say, you know, we're going to raise 50 basis points above the expectation. And in that case, you know, that would be extremely bearish. But when reality happens and reality happens exactly as the market expects, then, you know, a lot of those fears and those doubts and those worries about the worst case scenario are no longer a possibility, and that generates a sense of relief in the market. And that's why a lot of times when when you you see rallies off FOMC, no matter what the Fed says, right? Even if it's not a, a bullish setup, a lot of it's very very common. Like throughout all the interest rate hikes of um, 2022, when Bitcoin was in a severe severe downtrend, at least on the weekly chart, you could go to FOMC and see that even within that downtrend, you know. Um, Bitcoin tended to rally off FOMC because FOMC start, you know, they tended to raise interest rates exactly the way they would they said they would, and even though that applied fundamental downward pressure on the market, it still relieved the sense of, you know, fear and doubt and uncertainty that the Fed could, you know, could possibly, you know, uh, do an even more bearish scenario. Um, so you guys get the idea, but that's uh, basically what I'm thinking here. So I can mark this area off. You see that area right there is my risk management level. So I'm going to be bullish uh, until that level gets taken out. Uh, looking for a run up to these highs right here. So we're currently at 23,374. And this FOMC area is at a nice even low right here. You know, I, I feel comfortable saying if we get a daily close below twenty three thousand, uh, my my bullish bias is invalidated. But assuming we don't get that, assuming we get a close above and uh, daily continuation, uh, then I'd be looking for a to trade up into this area right here from the twenty three point three level we're at to basically twenty five point twenty five thousand. Um, you know, twenty five point three. Uh, whether you're using the bodies of the candles, right? I mean, you can use the bodies of the candles or the wicks. And again, there'll be nuanced price behavior on the lower time frames as price reaches up into this level. And that's really the last level of resistance is 25K level uh, prior to, you know, this big gap and void of uh, liquidity. So, you know, this is a good time to be uh, playing your positions if you are bullish and getting that uh, position because, it really is until uh, 25K is taken out that, you know, that the ra the potential rally, if, assuming this happens, would really start, right? Because when you get, when 25K gets taken out on a convincing basis, then that's when you get this gap fill up to this level up here. This area of inefficiency, they generally fill the same way that they were created, right? Yeah, created very inefficiently right here. Um you know, if you're if you're waiting for this level to break before uh, you know you end up getting in a long position, you're not going to have a lot of opportunity to do that after the break. You know, price will move uh, pretty aggressively at that point. Anyway, I hope you guys like this video. Uh, if you guys haven't subscribed already, please make sure to do that, and I'll catch you guys in the next.